Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Web's first images unfold the universe with web scientists event. I hear we have some special folks in the audience today. Maybe some future generation of astronomers, engineers, writers, maybe. How about educators, teachers, artists? Well, for our special audience today, we have a special panel of speakers from the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Science Institute. We're in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're here to chat with you all about the James Webb Space Telescope, which sometimes I'll call it Webb for short. Sometimes I'll use the first letter of the James Webb Space Telescope and say JWST. So we'll use all the words interchangeably. So sometimes I forget. So I wanted to remind you all um, or tell you all in case I do that. Well, you might ask, what is the Space Telescope Science Institute? Well, we are the Mission Operations Center for uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the telescope is commanded. That means we operate the telescope. We talk to the telescope. We give it instructions on how to observe the sky with its instruments. And we do that all from Baltimore. We're also the Science Operations Center, which means that we do a lot of coordination to figure out which targets uh, the telescope will point to. We provide the tools for scientists to do their proposing of what targets to look at, and we do the planning and scheduling. We store the information so anyone can get to it, and we also explain Webb's discoveries with the public like you all. It's really an amazing place to work. It's really fun. So let's start by hearing from our speakers who, are going, who will introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do in the Office of Public Outreach. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Emma Marcucci. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as Quinn said, my name is Dr. Emma Marcucci. I am a planetary scientist by training. I looked at Mars geology particularly volcanic environments on Mars and used places on Earth um, to simulate Mars, to pretend that they were like Mars. Um, at Space Telescope, I work with the Office of Public Outreach and the Science Communication and Branch, excuse me, the Science Communication and Engagement Branch, um, which I manage a great team of scientists, educators, community engagement specialists, that work with the other wonderful skill sets we have at the Institute and within OPPO to create these outreach products. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Marcucci. Next up, I'd like to introduce you all to uh, John Maple. Take it away, John. Hello, my name's John Maple. I work in the Office of Public Outreach with uh, Dr. Quinn and Dr. Emma. Um, I am an educator by trade. I bring the education background to the products and experiences that we develop using the science and discoveries of Hubble and now Webb. And that's what I do for Office of Public Outreach. Thanks, John. And next up, we have Joe DePasquale. Joe? Thanks, Quinn. Hi, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Joe DePasquale. I am a senior science visuals developer in the Office of Public Outreach. And that's just a fancy way of saying that I, I make the images uh, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, myself and my colleague, Elisa Pagan, we are the two image processors who take data from the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope and turn it into the beautiful imagery uh, that we use for all of our public outreach products and press releases. Great, thank you, Joe. And I'm, uh, my name is Dr. Quinn Hart. I'm a project scientist for the JWST Science Communications uh, in the Office of Public Outreach at Space Telescope. So what does that mean? I do a lot of planning, thinking, organizing of how we share all these web discoveries with you all and the public. It's a really fun, exciting time because you'll learn more about what the James Webb Space Telescope is. It's You'll learn more from uh, uh, John in a bit, so I won't share too much, but I am also an astronomer and I studied supermassive black holes in, um, in some of the largest systems in the universe called galaxies of cl uh, clusters of galaxies. So later on, I'm not only your moderator today, but I'll also be talking to you about galaxies in general. Um, so 
now that you know who will be speaking, I also wanted to give a shout out to some of the people in the background. So we have Grant Justice, who's helping do some tech in the background today. So thank you to Grant. And then we also have another scientist, Dr. Chris Britt, who will be helping us with, uh, uh, with, with the background and the questions from the different moderators at the different venues who are joining us today. So again, thank you everybody for coming today and we're gonna get started. So next slide, please. So part of today's uh, event uh, and, and panel of speakers, we're going to be using uh, Kahoot to have some interactivity between you all who are attending live right now. So for, for facilitators, please connect to Kahoot.it. The game pin is 7461477. So um, I'll just give everyone a second to get onto Kahoot here and there is a QR code there. Again, this is for the live audience uh, at this event right now. But for those of you who may not have access to Kahoot or listening to this archive uh, video later, you'll still be able to participate because we will use some old style tools called our hands and fingers one, two, three, and four. So even if you're not in the Kahoot, you can still participate and you can follow along. So I think, um, if everyone is ready here again, kahoot.it and the game pin is 7461477. All right. All right, so let's get started. Let's get to the next slide and we're going to take um, do an example here. So there's a practice question. So in Kahoot here, I'd like the facilitators to talk to the people in their audience and identify the blue diamond. Now we have two squares on the top and two squares in the bottom. So for the audience, if you think um, the red box here is one, blue is two, three is yellow, green is uh, four. So select the blue diamond and I will see in the Kahoot here via my colleague, uh, Chris Britt, when uh, the responses are going in. Again, this is just a test for all the facilitators uh, to make sure this is all working. So Chris, uh, let me know if it's working on your end. Okay, we're getting answers now, great. All right. So how are we doing, Chris? Yeah, we're still getting a few answers coming in. There's a little bit of a delay between us and the stream. So okay. we've got to give it a few more seconds for people. Great, thank you, Chris. Ten seconds left. All right, we have all our answers, and everybody selected the the blue diamond, except for one smart aleck who chose the red triangle. <laughs> All right, so great. Now we've got our tech. Uh, we know that it's working on your end. Um, and so sprinkled throughout today's presentation will be uh, several Kahoot questions. Um, and I'll let you know which responses might be number one for the audience, number two, number three, number four. So you can be able to interact with the facilitators uh, it, at your location um, as we go through this. Okay, great. Let's get started. Next slide, please. So right now I'm gonna pass over the presentation and John Maple will be talking to you um, about infrared light and the James Webb Space Telescope. Go for it, John. Thanks, Quinn. So everything that we can see here, the commonality between them all is that we can all see them because of visible light. Um, Grant, can you hit the next slide, please? But there are other kinds of light that we can't see. You can think for yourselves for a second, what kind of light have you ever thought of before, heard of before that maybe you haven't seen? So we're gonna go to the next slide. And all of those other kinds of light are part of what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. That's this very, very thin little part of it, which is visible light. That's the light that we can see, but there's so much more out there and there's so much more that 
can tell us about what's in the universe. Um, we have radio and radio waves, which are the waves that is actually light coming to your radio that then is changed into sound. There's radar waves, there's microwaves, there's infrared light, and that's what James Webb's specialty is. There's ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. And all these different um, wavelengths of light tell us different things about different objects out in the universe. And so Webb has a specialty in the infrared that can tell us about things from much farther away than we've been able to before. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's so cool about infrared light. Hit next slide, please. All right, facilitators, uh, we have a little demo here and the audience uh, participation is a one finger up, two fingers up, or three fingers up when I ask you to guess an answer. So we're gonna learn about what the power of red light is, which is redder than red. It's infrared, farther than red. So let's take a look at this next slide. All right, so here we have a picture. We have, you know, the gold mirror, a much, much smaller version of the gold mirror that Webb has, and we have three cups here that all have water in it. Um, with visible light, we just see that's a white cup, a yellow cup, and a blue cup, but we can't tell which cup is holding the hottest water. Take a guess right now what you think it's going to be. Facilitators, look at your group. Anybody holding up four fingers, say, try again, one through three. All right, everybody taking a guess. All right, let's move on to the next slide. And now on the left side of this, we see this in infrared light and on the right side, I'm sorry, the left side, visible light, right side, infrared light. And we can see the three cups, cup one, cup two, and cup three. So if you had your hand up showing one finger, you are correct. Go ahead and the next slide, Grant. This is the warmest one. It's glowing the most. The one on the far right, cup three, which is the blackest and purplish, oh, thanks, um, is the coldest. It's not emitting as much light as cup one and cup two. So this is what Webb can see in even greater detail of seeing the infrared light being emitted by objects in space. Go ahead and now we can do the next one. So infrared light is like heat. Our eyes are not sensitive enough to see it, um, but we can build tools that we can see it with. Um, you know, if you felt before, you can feel infrared. You can see it passing through some materials. Like in this picture, this gentleman has his hand in a trash bag and in visible light, we only see the trash bag. But when we look at it through an infrared camera, we can see his hand and arm emitting infrared light that can pass through that trash bag and it can be seen by the camera. Grant, go ahead and get the next one. And this is just a picture of JWST in the clean, or no, in the vacuum chamber, getting ready to go in the vacuum chamber for testing. Go ahead and hit the next one. So now we have a Kahoot question for you all. So as we're doing the Kahoot question, this is for all the facilitators at uh, our different event sites around the nation. Also feel free to use the IO to drop in questions from your audience as the speakers are talking uh, so that we can answer them right after, uh, so that we can ask the speakers those particular questions. So feel free to do that throughout today's event. Let me start my video, sorry. Um, so this is a Kahoot question. When um, so we've got the Webb Space Telescope is the only telescope currently in space. So that's the question for the facilitators. For our audience, is that a true question? A true answer um, statement? You put number one if you think it's true. If you think that's a false statement, hold up two fingers. 
true one, false two. So again, the Webb Space Telescope is the only telescope currently in space. So go ahead and get your responses and the facilitators can put your answer, uh, the majority of the answers into code. So go right ahead, we'll give that uh, a few seconds here. Oh, it looks like you're wrapping up the answers now. That's right. And it looks like most of you got the correct answer that it's false. Webb is not the only telescope currently in space. Ding, 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 ding. Yay. All right. So go ahead, John. Why don't you talk about um, some of the other telescopes that are in space? All right. So this whole fleet of space telescopes help us and astronomers cover that whole electromagnetic spectrum going from Hubble looking at um, optical and optical and ultraviolet light, Chandra looking at X-ray light, um, XMM Newton looking at uh, cosmic rays and um, gamma rays so that we can get the full picture of things to be able to understand all the details because we can't travel to any of the things right now that these telescopes are looking at but that light can bring us back information that we can study them and understand them better. All right, next slide, please. Um, so capturing that light is very important. And this picture shows us Hubble's primary mirror and Webb's primary mirror. Both telescopes are amazing in the science they're able to collect and the images they can collect. Webb's is much larger because infrared wavelengths of light you need to have a larger mirror to collect more light to be able to get that level of detail that makes web so amazing. Go ahead and click next one. Um, so where is web right now? Web right now is a million miles away from Earth. Um, we launched it in December. It took about it took a couple months to get to a point called L2 where it began orbiting going through commissioning and now is in science operations, looking into the cosmos, finding those really cool things and helping us answer those questions that our other telescopes have brought up for us. Next slide. So here's a little example of a slider that we have that demonstrates the difference between visible light and infrared light. We see right now the mirror cats and the crocodile. We can see invisible light. But in infrared light, they show up as very different looking. Um, so the meerkats emit much more light than the crocodile does. Next slide. So here's our next Kahoot uh, question. Which of the following are types of light here? So for Kahoot, um, you could select all that apply. So is are x-rays a type of light, infrared a type of light, green, or radio type of light? So go ahead, there's a little delay in, um, in the stream right now. So we're gonna get that started. So go ahead, which of the following are types of light? So x-rays is one, infrared's two, green is three, Radio is four. Go ahead and, and submit your responses. Now, as you're emitting, um, emitting, as you are putting in your responses here, you might be wondering what you're seeing on the left hand side. That is a exploded star. That's a supernova remnant. I'm not going to tell you what colors they're in. We've got about 20 seconds remaining. All right. So most of you knew know now that infrared is a kind of light uh but uh there are a lot of spread among the rest of the answers it's kind of a trick question in some ways so quinn i don't know if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide and talk about what makes this kind of a trick question yeah 
Go ahead. Uh, next slide, and John, I think you'll be doing this piece. Oh, no, actually, I am. Sorry. So going back to what John mentioned earlier, there's all types of light um, that we call collectively together the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, here's a hint. If that's uh, too big of a word to say and you're not sure, I say it really short. I say EM spectrum. So this includes all different kinds of light, gamma ray light, X-ray light, ultraviolet light, visible light, and that includes all the colors in the rainbow, like Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Those are all kinds of light as well. Infrared light, as you know, is the special kind of light that the James Webb Space Telescope can see. Microwaves are a type of light too, and radio. So, but we can only see visible light, um, like the green with our eyes, but altogether, there's all kinds of light, and guess what? There's all different types of telescopes that can see all those different kinds of light too. So right now, I just learned that Team Quark is in the lead from Kahoot. So um, go Team Quark there. All right, next slide, please. Uh, as I just mentioned, web specialization here is in the infrared. What is redder than red? Your eyes can't see it, but there are, there are there's the James Webb Space Telescope in space to be able to sense the infrared light from things um, in space. So thank you very much, John. Um, now we're gonna move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Emma Marcucci, who will talk to us about uh, the solar system and how Webb is uh, sending images to us of the infrared uh, solar system. So take it away, Dr. Marcucci. Thank you, Dr. Hart. So the first planet we're going to talk about is Mars. And the great thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is even though it's really, really powerful and can see very, very far away, it can also see things that are much closer to us. So our near our neighbor, Mars, which is a bit smaller than Earth, we visited quite a bit. You've probably heard of landers, the Mars rovers that have move around the surface or satellites that orbit. So you may ask, why is Webb looking at Mars? And the unique thing about Webb looking at Mars is that it can look at the whole planet in pretty much one snapshot. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side with the two boxes in it is a composite map of Mars from one of the satellites that took many, many orbits around the planet to build up this map. On the right hand side, you're seeing two images from Webb from JWST that can take a snapshot, um, one snapshot and see the, the whole planet. So that's helpful to have us look at global phenomenon, like how the atmosphere changes or what the atmosphere is doing. It can help identify um, how different parts of the planet are affecting one another without having to worry about being in the right place at the right time. So the uh, one of the other challenges for or one of the challenges for Mars is that because it is very close, it's very, very bright. So a lot of work has to go into making sure that we don't oversaturate the cameras. And quickly, what you're seeing at the top is pretty close to what you would see in visible light because it's reflecting a lot of sunlight um, and it's at a wavelength that's closer to that visible window. But the lower image that looks like different has a longer wavelength that goes more into what we call thermal wavelengths. And so it's reflecting the mostly the thermal energy or the heat. Um, so that bright section is the area where the sun is shining directly onto the planet and warming it up. And then as you move away from where the sun is, it's cooler. So I'm going to pause here and see if we have questions from the audience. So I'm taking a look at the I.O. So again, feel free facilitators at the host sites here. If you're getting questions from your audience, go ahead and drop them in and we can address any questions about Mars. And you have an expert right here to, to uh, ask that question. And as we wait to see if any questions about Mars come in, I'll also say that um, one of the um, additional unique things that Mars, that, excuse me, that JWST can do for Mars 
is look at how the atmosphere has changed. Because Mars is smaller than Earth, it, it doesn't have as much gravity, and so it's lost its atmosphere over the many years, it's, it, billions of years it's, it's been um, since it formed. It slowly lost its atmosphere. So the atmosphere is very thin. A, some, a wind that's really, really strong will actually just feel like a light breeze because there's not that much atmosphere. So one thing that JWST can do is it can look at spectra and it can look at the molecules in the atmosphere and observe changes um, uh, and detail how changes are happening, which might tell us more about what the atmosphere used to be like and how it's changed over time. Well, that sounds really fascinating, um, especially in Mars is that closest planet to, to Earth. And there's lots, I have lots of friends who are studying Mars too. And there's also rovers that are on Mars exploring uh, uh, various aspects of Mars. Um, I'm curious for all the other panelists, is there something really interesting in this image when you, we first saw it that you were curious about, even if you don't work in this area? So John or Joe? Uh, yeah, I can say I was really curious about the, uh, the the longer wavelength, the thermal emission that we see. That that's a very different looking image from a lot of other stuff that we've seen, um, even from from Webb itself. Looking at those wavelengths, it's, it's it just looks different to me. I mm -hmm. liked that. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can add what was really cool when I saw this for the first time too, is that the picture on the left is um it's a simulated mars image but it does have features about it so grant if you can point out the huygens crater that's labeled in the left hand image there and so it looks like a there's a crater like craters that we see on the moon now if you point to the upper left upper right hand side you start to see a hint of of that the this um in i'm sorry grant the upper right hand side the 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 um, salmon peachy looking image there's a huygens crater that's pointed out there see how you can kind of still see that so i if you look at the the image on the left in this upper right image you can start to see some of the, the terrain that gets mapped out as well so i thought that was really neat to be able to map out the web features to the, 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 the more of the visible light um, images. So we do have a question in the, the IO chat. So one question here to Dr. Marcucci, how big is Mars? Yes, so Mars is about half the size of Earth. Um, so it's, it's a, quite a bit smaller than we are. It's not quite as small as uh, Mercury, um, but it is the, so it's the second smallest of the planets that we have, Mars. Oh, so second smallest. So what is the smallest? So if we're talking just about planets and what we de now define as the eight planets, the smallest one is Mercury. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I think this is a question to uh, potentially Joe. He might know the answer off the top of his head. Do you know what the exposure times were for these Mars images? Uh, I don't know the exact exposure times, but I know that these had to be pretty um, very short exposures. Uh, and even at that short exposure, there still were some saturation issues. Um, and what I mean is that the Mars is so bright at these wavelengths that you have to just like really quickly turn the camera on and off to be able to catch any information at all. Otherwise, it's just totally blown out the detector. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, so we'll stop the Q&A here. Please continue to drop your questions into the IO. We'll have some time at the end for some additional questions and we can come back and we'll try to look up the exposure time question that was just posed. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, put this back to Dr. Marcucci to continue with her solar system um, slides. Excellent, thank you. Well, we're gonna go from the second smallest to the largest planet in the solar system. So Grant, if you go to the next slide, here we have Jupiter. Um, this is a the largest planet in the solar system. In fact, if you swept up all the other planets, they would easily fit within Jupiter. That's how big it is. It's twice as big as the next biggest planet. And it's a gas giant. So all of these swirls you're seeing represent clouds. There's not a solid surface like there is on Earth that you could go land on. Now, you might be used to seeing Jupiter as a red planet, and that's because invisible light, the light that we see is red. 
because of the way that we map colors and Joe, maybe later you can talk a little bit about how we map colors to, to Jupiter. The, the wavelengths that we're seeing turn to more of this blue color on the clouds. You do see some haze, some green and red haze at the north and south pole. The red piece are some of the aurora, um, which is a fascinating thing, very similar to what we have here on Earth, but to a much, much bigger scale. Um, and let's go to the next slide just to take a look at this image as well. If we take a look at this image um, set back a little bit, um, Webb is so powerful and it's able to detect really faint things that we're actually able to see the rings around Jupiter and some of the small moons. So you see them marked out as well as some diffraction spikes, um, which is, as Joe was mentioning earlier, some of that um, saturation on the detector. So as we wait for questions to come in the IO, Joe, I'd love to hear how, um, how you would approach this image with all of those clouds, particularly since clouds are moving, that must be really difficult to um, make a nice picture from. Yeah, that's right. Jupiter is actually very challenging to observe with Webb. Um, and for two reasons, one is that the planet itself is moving as Webb is taking the images. And also it is rotating very quickly. It rotates completely in about 10 hours. And so as you're taking your images, you know, to make a color image, you have to take one image at a time in different filters and combine them together to get color. Uh, while that's happening, the planet is rotating and moving, and so everything gets smeared out. You have to sort of back out that movement. Hey, Joe, would you yes. say it's kind of like if I was taking a picture with my cell phone and someone moved by it really fast, it would look streaky? Yeah, well, take it to the extreme and go to the racetrack and try to take a picture of a car flying by at 200 miles an hour. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> wow, that sounds yeah. like a, a really complicated uh Thing that you have to consider with what you do, which we'll hear yeah. about in a little bit. Yep. All right. Um, Dr. Marcucci, do you, I think you have one more image, right? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to jump to the next one and we'll try to answer any more Jupiter questions later. So going even farther out in the solar system, we get to Neptune and its moon Triton. So Neptune is the most distant planet. It's 30 times farther away from Earth, uh, or uh, 30 times farther away. Um, for, uh, from the sun than Earth is. And so we don't have an opportunity to study it that much because it's so far away and it's in a dark part of the sky that the sun just looks like almost like a star. Um, so this is a really, really exciting and unique image. One of the best views we've gotten of Neptune since the 1980s when Voyager 2 flew by and this wonderful, wonderful view of the rings. Um, Grant, can you go to the next slide? So you can, you can even see, in addition to the rings, there are seven of Neptune's 14 moons that are shown here. A lot of these moons are really tiny, probably just captured asteroids. So Webb is so, so powerful that it's able to pick up these tiny moons and very faint rings. Now, one thing you might notice is when you think when you hear Neptune, you may think blue because it's an ice giant. It has um, it has a methane its atmosphere that that reflects blue light. In this image, it's a bit of a brighter um, image while Triton is blue. So Triton is um, covered in a layer of nitrogen ice that is able to reflect most of the light. That's why it's so bright and has these spikes, as opposed to Neptune, which actually absorbs a lot of light in Webb's wavelength and show it shows up as this more distinct, dimmer image. The white splotches or the white streaks you see are actually clouds that are very bright and able to reflect sunlight. So I'm gonna pause there and see if we have any quick questions before we go to the next topic. Yeah, I, there are some questions and I'm gonna pose one question to you now and take more at the end like we, uh, like you mentioned. How long has the great red spot been been storming from the Jupiter image that you uh, we saw earlier? Yes. So I don't know exactly when it started. The great red spot has pretty much always been observed. So several hundred years, even from the very early telescopes, it was able to be observed because it was so big. It's about um, two to three times the diameter of Earth. So if you sat Earth in there, that's about how big it is. And it does actually change with time. We can see it grow. We can see it shrink. We see other storms pass by and get sucked into it. 
Great, that's really fascinating. So we'll come back to, again to more uh, solar system questions um, at the end if we have some time. So right now we are going to move on to the, our next topic, which um, is really fascinating and learning about it uh, as I've been working here in the Office of Public Outreach has been great. And we have the expert to tell you all about it. So I'm gonna hand this off to Do Joe De Pasquale. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Queen. I'm sorry. Thanks. Uh, yep, go ahead. Okay. I am going to share my screen now. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about how we made the image of the Carina Nebula here. Um, <clears throat> but before I do that, I just want to give you some context as to how the images come about. Uh, Webb has a number of detectors. This is actually a model of the detector called MIRI, which is its mid infrared detector. But the thing I really want to show you here is as the light path comes into the detector, there is a filter wheel, which is a physical mechanism that has multiple filters that allows Webb to view very specific wavelengths of infrared light. And so we were talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. This wheel here actually takes, even within infrared light, it breaks that down into even smaller portions of just infrared light. And that's how we're able to take images in different wavelengths of infrared to pull them together to make a color image. And so how do we do that? The image actually comes down to us uh, in a format called FITS, which stands for Flexible Image Transport System. And FITS files have a lot of dynamic range to them. And that just means there's a huge range from the darkest darks in the image to the brightest whites. And so when we first open these images, they look essentially black. And what we're seeing here is actually on the left side is the image of uh, Webb's first image of a deep field. And on the right is something called a histogram. And the way I like to think of a histogram is imagine this image on the left, all the pixels just fell on the floor and you had to pick it up and organize it somehow. And so you pick up one pixel and you say, okay, this one is black. I'm going to put that in my black bin. And then you pick up another one and say, this one's light gray. I'm going to put that in the light gray bin. Now this is kind of complicated because we're talking about a 16 bit image, which means every pixel in the image has over 65,000 different possible values, which you could never see with your eyes. So let's simplify things a little bit. Instead, we'll look at this image of a parrot. Okay, this is a two-bit image, which means that there are only four possible values per pixel. And so if all of the pixels fell on the floor from this image, you could easily say, okay, this one's white, this one's light gray, this one's dark gray, and this one's black. And as you put those pixels into your stacks, you end up building what we call a histogram. So going, um, <clears throat> going back to how do we get this information out of the image, uh, you know, we, we first looked at that deep field image, it looked black. We have to do something called stretching the image to be able to see the information contained within it. So on the left is our, sorry, on the left is the original image. On the below here, what I'm showing is what we call a curves adjustment, and that is just changing those values in the pixels. So in the middle panel, we're doing what's called a linear change to the pixels. We're just changing the slope of the line. Um, <clears throat> what, that, what that means is we're taking the white point and just dragging it to the left. And so now we have the bin of white pixels, we have the bin of light gray pixels and the bin of dark gray pixels, they're all white. And so that's what happened up here in the image. We've made it brighter, but in doing so, we've actually lost some information. We've lost some detail in the image. Uh, next to that, we have what we call a nonlinear transformation of the pixel values. And here, this actually preserves some of that information in the brighter pixels and allows us to see that information while also raising up all the overall pixel values in the entire image. So this is what we mean when we say stretching the image. Now, if we do that to the deep field image with a linear stretch, you know, that's the middle panel where we lose information, uh, we can see that there's a ton of information contained in the image and it was all in that black, you know, dark area of the histogram, which is now spread out here. We can see how much information was contained in there. But because we did this with a linear stretch, we've actually completely blown out the bright portions of the image and we've lost information about the galaxy cluster. <clears throat> so we can use a nonlinear transformation to, uh, to change those pixel values, to bring them up and allow you to see the faint features in the image while simultaneously preserving the information that's contained in the brighter regions, like the core of the galaxy cluster here. So in this, this is a nonlinear stretch using, um, this is actually free software called Fitz Liberator that anyone can use. Um, and at the bottom here, we're looking at a different view of the same kind of histogram as what I was showing earlier. And you can see that we've stretched it so that you can you know, see all the detail in the histogram, which correlates to the information contained within the image. 
So going back to our image of the Carina Nebula, this is what um, all of the different filters that make up that image look like when they're not stretched. This is the, the linear uh, image for each one of them. Uh, the numbers under these images actually correspond to the wavelengths of light. It's all infrared, but remember back to our little movie, there's the filter wheel. Uh, this using the NearCam camera, we've taken images in six different filters. And so we're going from shorter infrared wavelengths to longer infrared wavelengths. And <clears throat> we can then stretch that data to be able to see the information contained within. And now we're seeing a lot of interesting information. And there's also a lot of differences between the different filters. And that's what gives rise to all of the variations of color when we pull this all together in color. So how do we get to the color part? This is really, uh, this is like the meat of how these images are made. Um, I'm gonna go back to what we've been talking about throughout this entire presentation, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, just to remind you, the visible light is all that we can see with our eyes, but this is actually very important. The way that our eyes work, it, give, it gives us some information and it allows us to take advantage of how our eyes work to be able to shift this, um, the way that our eyes work into other wavelength regimes like infrared or ultraviolet or X-ray. Our eyes are made up of cells that are sensitive to light. <clears throat> and it just so happens that um, our eyes evolved on a planet that orbits a star that emits most of its light in the visible wavelengths. And that's what we're looking at here in this uh, curve on the top right. This is a uh, emission curve of the sun with the peak being invisible. And I've pulled out down here uh, roughly the wavelengths of light that our eyes are sensitive to, which corresponds to basically the colors red, green, and blue. And so those are the primary colors when you're adding light together uh, to be able to reproduce what our eyes can see. Um, our eyes are only sensitive to those specific wavelengths, but because of the way they work and combining them in different amounts, we can actually see all the colors of the rainbow that way. And so if we apply this to the images and we take the shortest wavelength and give that blue, and the longest wavelengths red and everything in between moves from red to green to blue, then we get something that looks like this. And the combination of all of these images together is what gives us the, uh, the final version of the Carina Nebula image. Oh, sorry, that just jumped. Okay. <clears throat> now I wanted to do something fun with this as well. I'm gonna jump out of this presentation and I've got Karina up here and I'm using, um, software that allows me to draw on the image as we're looking at it. And so we can zoom in and out and point out some interesting features here. <clears throat> Joe, really quickly, before you um, describe some of the features, can you tell people what this object is called and what they're looking at? <laughs> yes, I was just about to get into that. Okay, so this is the uh, Carina Nebula. Um, this is actually a region in space near, towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, there is a dust cloud, and that's what we're seeing at the bottom portion of the image is the, a, a, a region of uh, dust and gas that is actually being eroded by a cluster of hot young stars that is actually just above this image here. Um, that is, is the, the winds of these stars are pushing against these regions of denser gas and dust and causing them to, to be shaped into these different um, the different shapes that we see in the image. Um, also what we're seeing in infrared light is that we can actually penetrate into the cloud and see what's happening interior to the clouds. And in some cases we're seeing some really interesting things. Like if I zoom into this region here, there's actually a young star in the process of forming in this region, uh, not there, right here. And what's happening when a star forms like this, it, it collapses under its own gravity, uh, it has a, a disk of material around it, and as material is falling onto it, it also emits jets um, above and below it. And in this case, we're looking at jets that are shooting out of the cloud towards us in this direction, and then jets that are going into the cloud this way. And so we see this sort of carving out a shape within the cloud and then sending little bullets of material through the cloud all the way out to here. Same thing is happening here, except now instead of going into the cloud and out of it, it's kind of just running right alongside the cloud. But the jets are interacting with material in the cloud and getting sort of corkscrewed and uh, taking on interesting shapes as they do that. Um, we see another similar thing like that elsewhere in this region um, over here. Sorry if this is moving fast. There's actually a star that's embedded deep within the cloud right here. 
um, at these wavelengths, we can't see it. Um, but with, with the mid infrared, we actually can see that. And I can actually turn that on. Um, I have that as a different layer on here. So if, as I'm blinking this, I'm actually realizing the star is slightly off from where I drew it. <clears throat> But this is actually bringing in mid infrared wavelengths. So we're seeing a little more into the cloud as I'm blinking back and forth. Now the star that's emitting these jets is causing all of this turbulence that we see in the cloud here. So the stars around here, the jets are coming out this way and this way. Uh, it's causing this, what we call a bow shock as the jet interacts with the cloud and all the material around it. And then what's really fascinating about this one is that because it because of its position in the cloud towards the edge, this jet has actually punched a hole out of the cloud. And that's why we see all of this this turbulence here and this sort of, you know, this really you can almost see how something could be shooting out of the cloud, causing all of this disturbance. And if you follow the path of where this would lead, there's actually a little bullet of material up here that because it hasn't had to interact with anything has shot much further away from the cloud than anything else we've seen. Uh, so it's going sort of in that direction. And this is our interstellar material that's been shot out of that cloud. Um, another interesting thing within this region is that uh, Webb, you know, being as sensitive as it is, it actually can still see background galaxies. You know, pretty much wherever Webb looks, it sees galaxies. This region is very uh, dense with gas and dust, and so it doesn't see as many galaxies as we normally would, but they're still there. We see one right here. Um, there's a few others contained. They're very faint. There's one down here. Here's an edge on one here. And so this is just demonstrating the power of Webb to be able to see something you know, through a very dense region towards the center of our, our own galaxy. We're actually seeing completely through our galaxy, and, and those background galaxies are coming through and shining through that way. And that's all I have. So I think we can move on to questions or the, the next part of the talk. Why don't we leave this slide on for a second? Okay. And there was a question um, from the audience, which is, how did scientists learn to change the color in these images? Uh, well, going back to what, how I explained how these images are put together, uh, using that chromatic order is so important. It's built off of the way that our eyes work and it's built off the way the universe works. It turns out that no matter where you are in the electromagnetic spectrum, if you have things that are higher energy, they tend to be bluer. We say that, you know, it's sort of irregardless of the color, uh, the visible spectrum, things that are hotter, more energetic are bluer, and things that are lower energy, longer wavelengths are redder. And so if you use that philosophy of light and color all the way across, whether you're in infrared or X-ray or gamma ray, you'll still get uh, a beautiful image that that tells you more about this region than you would get from a, a black and white image. So would you say that you're using Roy G. Biv just in the infrared? Because that's chromatic ordering, right? That's Red, right, yes. Orange, yellow. So for the audience, the young astronomers in there, you this is representative color. It's it's a choice that Joe has made, but he does it with intention using an order that's kind of like the colors of the rainbow. And we do this with X-ray images. We do this with ultraviolet images. Uh, we could do it in radio as well. So great, great questions from the audience. Keep them coming. Um, I think now, uh, Grant, uh, thank you so, so very much, Joe. Um, so Grant, if you can go back to the slide deck and there is a Kahoot question on slide 27. You can start there. Sure, one moment. Great. So you've heard a lot of amazing things about planets, and you've also heard some things about um, a nebula. So let's see what um, uh, some questions here to see what you might have, um, what you might know here. Okay, so we've got four images here of the sun, which is a star. We've got the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. So the question here for everybody is, can you put them in order from what is the largest in size to the smallest in size? So option one is largest to smallest is Sun, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. Choice number two, is Mars, Earth, Jupiter, Sun. Choice number three is Jupiter, Sun, Earth, Mars. And 
uh, choice four is Sun, Jupiter, Earth, Mars. So go ahead and um, put in your Kahoot answers. So for those in the audience um, using your fingers to vote, one, two, three, and four. One is the red ordering, two is the yellow ordering, three is the blue ordering, and four is the green ordering. So Chris will let us know as the results are coming in. All right, I think a lot of people ran out of time on that one, um, but everyone who answered got it right. So well done. Great. All right, next slide, please. So what is this ordering from biggest to smallest, largest in size, the sun is the largest, then it's Jupiter. Jupiter is about 10 times smaller than the sun. Then we've got Earth and then we've got Mars. And we learned that Mars is about half the size of the Earth. So, um, so these are the size ordering from the planets. So now we have another Kahoot question, I believe is the next slide. Now the question is, what is a nebula? Is it one, a special type of spiral galaxy. Two, is it a cloud of gas and dust in space? Three, is it a small rocky body orbiting the sun? Or four, any object in space that is not a planet? So go ahead and take a, a, a use your brains here and think what is a nebula and put in your responses. All right, so how are we doing, Chris? Doing well, I'm trying to give people a little bit more time to answer on this one. So we've okay. got 45 seconds <laughs> left. We've got a few answers coming in. All right. Again, what is a nebula? Special type of spiral galaxy, one. Cloud of gas and dust, two. A small rocky body orbiting the sun, three. Or four, an object in space that is not a planet. Okay. Yeah, everybody got that one right as well. Great. Next, uh, let's see, there's a, yeah, go ahead and uh, next slide, please, Grant. So a nebula is a cloud of gas and dust in space. So the Carina Nebula, as you saw earlier from Joe, is a nebula. Um, cloud, stars can blow off these clouds of dust and gas at the end of their lifetime, forming the nebula. There's even um, gas that's in between stars. A lot of people think space is empty when it actually is not. There's a lot of dust and gas, and that, that's what we need to form stars. So um, we're close. Let's see. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. Now here's another Kahoot question. Which of these nebula are not in our own Milky Way galaxy? So we've got an image, an infrared image uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's called the Tarantula Nebula. And then we have the Carina Nebula here. So which one is not in our Milky Way galaxy? Is that one, the Tarantula Nebula, or two, the Carina Nebula? So this is again in Kahoot. All right, the code is open, answers are coming in. All right. Yeah. You guys are getting good. Lots of lots of people getting the right answer there. So we have finished up with the questions. We can move on. All right. 
So first I want, so the Milky Way galaxy, some of you might have heard that word before. Um, so a galaxy is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars. Now, if we could take a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, it might look something like what you see on screen here. But uh, this is just a model because we actually don't have a picture of the Milky Way like this. The Carina Nebula is actually inside our galaxy along one of the spiral arms. So a spiral galaxy is just one type of galaxy that has this beautiful pinwheel shape. Now that tarantula nebula that you saw earlier is not inside our Milky Way galaxy. It's actually in a little galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's a galaxy near the Milky Way. And if you've ever been to the Southern Hemisphere, you might actually see that um, as a small smudge in the sky. I've not seen it. So if you've seen it, that's pretty cool. Um, but, the, but there are clouds, nebulae in other places other than our own galaxy. So things can be within our galaxy or outside. All right, I hear that Delphinus, it's a great name, has taken the lead. Um, for those of you who don't know um, Delphinus, it is a constellation name and I know it because it's Delphinus the dolphin. It's a very fun constellation to look at. It looks like a little kite in the sky. All right, so Grant, we are going to go to slide 35, which is the last Kahoot question. And then we are going to take questions after that from the audience. So yes, right here. So here is an image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, actually, of the deepest image of space that we've ever taken. So the question is, uh, put the following in order from largest to smallest. So one, I'm sorry, one universe, galaxy, planetary system, star. Again, we're going to do size here. What's the biggest to smallest? Second, it's a planetary system like our solar system, a galaxy, a star, or a universe. Three, galaxy, universe, planetary system, or star. And four, universe, planetary system, galaxy, or star. So again, we're putting them from largest to smallest. And I'll repeat the order. Option one, universe, galaxy, planetary system, star. Two, Planetary system, galaxy, star, universe. Three, galaxy, universe, planetary system, star. Option four, universe, planetary system, galaxy, star. All right, something seems to have gone wrong with the Kahoot timer, but still, you can still try to answer locally. And Chris will give us an idea of what the answers are coming in here. Hi, yeah, something went wrong with the Kahoot timer, so there wasn't enough time for people to really answer on this one. Okay, well then, Grant, if you can move to the next slide. From largest to smallest, smallest, yeah, the universe is everything. So it's the largest. Now, galaxy is pretty big. It's actually a combination of planets around stars. There could be hundreds of billions of stars. So the galaxy is the next biggest thing. A planetary system is all the planets, comets, debris, asteroids around a star. And then the star itself would be the smallest. So great job thinking about all of that and the size of the solar system and of the universe and of nebulae. So right now, um, I'm gonna take some questions from the IO. So there was a question of uh, here if, um, can you see exoplanets? So we're going to take a few questions from um, from the I.O. and I'll open this up to the panelists. So, Grant, you can go ahead and just um, turn off the slide deck and we'll just have the panelists on, on, on and we can just answer questions. I can jump in with the exoplanet question. So there was actually a result, um, I think last week or a week or two ago, that was one of the first or the first direct image of an exoplanet that Webb took. Um, uh, exoplanets are can be very close to their star, so it's hard to take an image of them. But um, some of JWST instruments have what's called a coronagraph. It's kind of like blocking out the light of a really bright lamp with your hand so you can see something next to it. So yes, Webb can see exoplanets, but possibly even, or I would say even more powerful, is that Webb can take spectra of exoplanets. So 
that is a way to look at the different types of um, atmospheres or temperatures or direction that um, a planet is moving um, by looking at how the light in that EM spectrum we saw earlier um, gets absorbed through the atmosphere. So Webb will tell us a lot about exoplanets. Yeah, I'm very excited um, to be able to see some of those the exoplanets are really amazing. That there's planets around other stars that the James Webb Space Telescope can help us to understand. There's about, I haven't looked recently, but I think the number of exoplanets that we know about is upwards of 5,000 perhaps, all within our own galaxy. So another question here is how far can the telescope see? Well, that's a really interesting question. So I'll take that. So light takes time to travel through space. So another way to answer that, uh, to ask the same question, but in a different way, is how far can we see into the past? Because if light's out there in space, it needs to travel to us and it takes time to do that. So those things in space are far away from us. But if we say, well, how far can we see? Well, how long into the past can we see? Well, we can see pretty far into the past. We can see the universe. Webb will help us see very far back in time, almost to when the universe was 250 million years old. Now you might say, well, how old is the universe? It's 13.7 billion years old. So we can see pretty far back in time and that's seeing things that are really far, far, far away. So very far away. <laughs> um, let's have another question here. Um, how far are the objects in the cloud from each other? Joe, do you have, uh, do you remember in the Carina Nebula? Yeah, so um, I can say that from the bottom of the image to the top of the middle cloud is about, I think, four or five light years. So this is a huge structure that we're talking about. A, a single light year is the distance that light travels in one year, which is about six trillion miles. So it's numbers that are just like mind boggling and it's four of those, right? So it's just this humongous region in space. Um, Webb can see it so well because it is so big. Even though it's so far away, we can actually still see those details. Great. Um, let's see. Cat, so the here at everyone really loves. Uh, okay, um, one of the upvoted questions here: How have modern constellations changed? So, would anybody like to take a stab at that question? By modern constellations, I'm assuming they mean like the traditional Roman Greek ones that we talk about in Western culture, like Orion and Pegasus and Andromeda, et cetera. Yeah, um, I, I think that's my guess. Unfortunately, we can't go back and forth with yeah. the sites right now. So that that's my guess. Uh, for example, just uh, Delphinus is, is the number one in the Kahoot. And we mentioned that Delphinus is a constellation. So if you want to take a stab at it, Dr. Marcucci, go right ahead. Um, well, I, constellations are really interesting um, because they usually represent stories from a culture. So depending on what culture you're talking about, there are different constellations um, and they represent different stories. Um, I used to work in Alaska, and so I learned a bit about the native Alaskan um, uh, constellations. And uh, for example, the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades, that was actually a bundle of fish or a litter of puppies or a timepiece, depending on which culture you were in. Um, so the constellations kind of change um, between different cultures, or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere. I don't believe that um, they've moved in terms of how the stars move, because stars are moving too, in terms of changing the shape. We haven't really observed them long enough to say like Orion used to be a lot smaller or a lot bigger. Um, those those changes happen over these astronomical time scales and the time that we've been observing the sky um, is too short of a period to see those kinds of changes. Great. Thank you so much. I just noticed how quickly the time flew by. So we're right at the end of our event. So I wanted to. Um, uh, tell you the winners of our Kahoot here. So Team Delphinus uh, is number one in the Kahoot. So congratulations. Uh, team Quark, which is number two. And of course, I love Q. Um, so that's awesome. And then we've got um, uh, in third place here is 
uh, SBM of, I'm assuming of New Hampshire here. So congratulations to the, the top three. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers who came today from uh, Space Telescope Science Institute and the Office of Public Outreach. Uh, we really appreciate your time uh, sharing the wonders of web with our audience. And I thank the audience for um, joining us today and um, keep listening to the news. There's some amazing things that we are seeing with Webb and come along on the journey as we learn more about the universe. So have a great day, everybody. Bye.